This session is about FOIA research that's actually useful. Um, I, I, you know, I, I hate research that is not useful. And there's a lot of it out there. No, no offense to my fellow esteemed scholars here in academia, but um, there's a lot of fooey that gets published uh, by, by my peers and uh, it doesn't go anywhere. So our objective in this competition this, this year is to really encourage high quality scholars like these folks and folks in this room mm -hmm. to do research that would, would be of use to practitioners, to you, to the coalitions, to society, that will make a difference because ultimately that's what we want to do. So hopefully uh, that's what we're going to do here. And I was floored by the response. I expected like two submissions and one of those would be like a flyer for Pizza Hut coupons. That's kind of what I expected. And no, 18 submissions, uh, peer reviewed, 12 selected, three top papers with winning cash, thanks to NFOIC for offering that. I think that might have helped the submission, perhaps, motivation, but, um, but uh, very good. And, and uh, I want to do an overview. I hope we can do this annually if you like it. If you don't, then we don't have to. Uh, so let us know afterward. But um, I think there is a lot of research already out there. Uh, if we look at, for example, uh, all right, let me see here. Uh, this isn't working, clicker's not working. Ah, this is why. Is this oh, the thing? Okay, there we go. Um, so I have a handout. It's nine pages because I don't want to read it to you. Uh, nine pages, single space of research that you would find useful when you're talking with legislators to justify fighting bills, to figure out what's going on around the country. I've boiled it down into several sections. I'm just going to highlight a few just to show how this actually could be useful. Um, the handout, and I'll show this again at the end, you can take a picture of that at the end and then get it online. Uh, for example, there's a lot of research out there and huge amount that's been coming on board just in the past 10 years. Phenomenal amounts of research coming in. The FOI makes a difference. For example, uh, studies are showing that, that transparency laws, FOI, reduces corruption. We know that theoretically, but there's quantitative research that's showing that actually is true. Meta-analysis of 187 studies that show this is true. You grab this study and you use that when you fight for your legislation. There's a study that shows uh, dissemination of sex offender information um, encourages them not to relapse. Our, these laws, this transparency, keeps sex offenders out of your room, out of, out of your house. That's important. These laws make drinking water cleaner. They get jurisdictions to actually have cleaner drinking water. A study showed that um, these laws make uh, your restaurant food cleaner, um, that a direct connection between dissemination of restaurant inspections and cleaner restaurants. Uh, these, the, these studies show that for every dollar spent on uh, public records-based investigative reporting by newspapers, that dollar generates $287 in societal benefit. $287 for every dollar, that is huge ROI. That is benefits to society. Uh, and, and all these are cited in the handout. And you can get the studies and have them in hand when you go talk to folks. Uh, there's lots of studies rating the states. So uh, Bill Chamberlain for two decades uh, had rated the states, how their strength of their law. The site is down, you have to find it through the Wayback Machine. Uh, the citation is in the handout. You can get to it. Center for Public Integrity uh, rated the states in their transparency. You can look at how your state is based on interviews and surveys of journalists and what they thought. Um, the U.S. PERG rates the amount of information posted proactively on state websites and they rate the states. You can look at that, how your state is. I'm just wrapping up a study that where I look at actual compliance with public records request analyzing muckrock data all across the country. I've calculated a compliance rate for every state. Uh, 
uh, the percentage of requests that actually result in public records for the requester. Um, it's the first measure that I know of that actually measures on the street actual compliance with public record laws across the nation. You can kind of see the map a little. The darker states are the better ones. The lighter states are the lowest compliance. And in fact, when you look at the ratings, and a lot of you can't see the numbers, but um, it ranges from a high of 60, well, two-thirds of public records requests complied with in Washington State and Idaho, uh, the high, the best states in America, down to a low of Alabama of only 10%. Uh, the le least compliance to public record laws in America uh, and everything in between. And the interesting thing about this data, and you, you, you can, um, uh, I'd be happy to share this with you, but um, uh, this, this uh, data and measure is highly correlated with other measures of uh, corruption and cronyism. So this is, this, in other words, um, it has a validity as a good measure for good governance. Uh, whether or not they comply with the law. The other thing I noticed is that it's highly correlated, uh, compliance is highly correlated with states that have mandatory fee shifting uh, provisions in their laws. It's the only part of state laws that actually matter. I tested it with all sorts of other things, penalties, other things, and there's, compliance does not match with anything in state laws other than attorney fee shifting provisions. That tells us that if we're going to focus our efforts somewhere, that might be a place. Uh, those are the kind of practical things we can get out of research. Um, lots of studies looking at comparing at various records across the country by state. So there's uh, a great uh, study on penalty provisions in state laws comparing across the nation by CHIP here several years ago. Penalty provisions, uh, uh, there's a um, there's studies about email and what's public and what isn't and where in the country, who's using it, private devices. Uh, one study by Joey Sennett from Oklahoma, some of you know Joey. Um, there's a study that will be presented at the poster session today at the reception by Josh Moore on access to private university police records at private campuses, uh, private universities, uh, looking at the state at the nationwide and comparing. These are great studies to look at how your state compares to other states. Uh, and, and they don't look just at the statutes, they also look at the case law, uh, uh, attorney general's opinions, all that stuff that we need to know. Uh, lots of practical studies on request strategies. For example, studies show that uh, formal requ letter requests um, typically will get about 73% compliance in this one study versus informal requests which will only yield about 50%. So you get more compliance with formal letters as opposed to, opposed to informal. Uh, not to mention uh, women with PhDs who request records are three times as more likely to get a record than a woman who doesn't have a PhD. Um, I'll have to make requests for you. <laughs> there you go. Which shows you which shows you that, uh, uh, and there have been other studies that look at the requester person and, and, and what gets, who gets a better response than others. Uh, peer pressure works. A study in North Carolina showed that if you tell an agency, hey, I'd like this record, and by the way, uh, County Jones, Jones County, uh, Montgomery County next to you gave it, so, uh, you know, uh, why don't you follow along. Uh, far more likely to give you records if you mention that. So if, if you go out and get a record from one place, mention it, particularly if it's a neighboring counter, you're far more likely to get the records. All these little experiments and field experiments that have been run that looked at uh, that sort of thing. Not to mention context. Um, we have, um, um, oh, let me back up there before I show that, flash that again. Um, RT, the ratings of national laws. You may know that U.S. FOIA rates 69th in the world when it comes to the strength of its law. Um, under such countries as Russia, um, which has a much better law than us, and they're happy about it. Afghanistan, number one in the world. Mexico, number two. Uganda, other countries. So our law is not the best in the world. Now, of course, what does that tell us? Laws may not matter in some context overall. 
um, uh, application uh, may not. Bigger agencies provide records more readily than small agencies experiments show. Um, certain people who have a harder time getting records, a study showed uh, nonprofits are more likely to get a response than journalists, than minorities. Minorities just 11% of the time, uh, nonprofits 33% uh, of the time. We have a problem in our society still. Um, uh, litigation at the FOIA level is going way up according to TRAC, and a lot of you have probably looked at TRAC out of Syracuse University, but there is no data to compare at the state level. We don't really know what's going on at the state level very, and we need more research on that. Uh, and then finally, to wrap up, because I want to get to these folks, public attitudes. There's a lot of research on how to convince people to support FOI. We find that people who are educated, a little older, um, and uh, more affluent are more supportive of public access, as well as those who are skeptical, cynical, those who uh, use the internet more for information seeking, not for cat videos, um, are more likely to be supportive of information. Um, those who, um, if you remind them of the thought of death or just say the word 9-11, uh, it will polarize the population. The people who support openness will become more fervent for openness and people who support national security or secrecy will dig in there. And all I had to say is 9-11. That's a, a psychological experiment. It changes attitudes by just those kind of things even. Um, lots of these studies and experiments that sh show what uh, we can do to move the needle and improve, uh, improve our communities in our state. So there again, um, nine pages of studies annotated with links where it's available that um, you can tap into and read on the airplane on the way home. Um, all right, let's move on. I just want to give that highlight, and I apologize if I went on too long. Um, we have a great panel. These are, um, these are, 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 are top papers. Uh, they were reviewed by uh, 12 judges, uh, esteemed scholars from Yale, from all over the country, uh, amazing uh, FOI scholars. Uh, and uh, coalition leaders. Uh, thank you, Deborah and others who volunteered because we wanted a little, you know, we needed some real people to also judge them. Um, now, Alexa uh, actually placed second in the competition, but we didn't want her to repeat her presentation twice. So, so we, we had uh, the fellows uh, come up and uh, to present their thing on legislative records. Uh, actually, you guys place fourth, uh, which is, oh, oh, that's right, Patrick. Yeah, Patrick and Leah there. Yeah, um, you, you placed fourth, which has no money with it. So I'm sorry. But, uh, um, but, uh, but they're all very good papers, very close, very competitive, stellar work that's going to be published, no doubt. And, um, after, at, toward the end of the conference, you'll get an email with all the papers on them, I believe, unless some author, you know, has an issue. Um, then, uh, then you can read them yourself. All right, with that, let's start. Chip and Amy, you get to go. Uh, two top scholars who have well published in this area. Do, uh, I'm not even gonna say that title. <laughs> all right, take it away. Um, hey everyone, um, first off, so I'm Chip Stewart, um, I'm Texas through and through, I, went to, I, I grew up in Arlington, I went to college in Dallas, I teach over in Fort Worth, I do my law school in Austin. I just want to say welcome to Texas, in case you haven't gotten a nice firm welcome to Texas yet. Welcome to Texas, thank you for coming here. Uh, we've got some interesting laws here, uh, we'll talk a little bit about those today because they actually are very influential um, and we're seeing some of the trends here uh, shake out other places in the country, we wanted to talk about that. Um, what inspired this project? Um, was the Amazon headquarters um, award. Oh yeah, we'll move quick. Um, that uh, if you didn't see when the Amazon uh, headquarters two uh, uh, were awarded to Virginia and uh, New York, both of them had provisions in, in the deals the uh, regions made um, to help them basically conspire to get around open records laws. Um, they said that, and I think, think some of the language in here is from Virginia, um, a promise for, for um, local authorities 
um, to limit disclosure, refuse to disclose, redact, or omit portions of materials to the maximum extent permitted by applicable law. It basically was going to give Amazon a heads up any time that people were requesting documents about their deal and allowing Amazon to come and intervene and slow things, um, either uh, by making an informal request to the, uh, uh, the government agency or uh, by going to court. And it's something we've seen more and more. There's a Supreme Court case coming up that's about this very sort of thing as well. Um, this is coming in the context here in Texas in particularly about uh, Boeing versus Paxton. Um, how many of you have heard of Boeing versus Paxton here before? I'm guessing probably a good portion. In case you haven't, it was the case out of 2015 that, that uh, the Supreme Court kind of blew open a hole. Okay, kind of uh, weak. It, nice. it blew open a <laughs> hole in, in the public records law uh, that basically said uh, that any document the government had that might reveal something that could, that could not would or must, uh, but that might um, damage uh, the competitive harm or cause competitive harm to a private business um, could be redacted or could be exempted. Um, Boeing had intervened on a, a, a citizen's um, request to get a, a contract uh, uh, with uh, the city of San Antonio. Um, a similar uh, case came up later on, we'll talk about uh, as well. But uh, since Boeing versus Paxton, I think the number now is that uh, the AG has uh, cited Boeing versus Paxton to deny requests um, to. Um, government records held by private businesses doing government business uh, in 2,600 cases um, since, uh, since 2015, uh, Houston uh, Chronicle report uh, earlier this year. Um, and again, we've got another one, it's a, a trade secrets competitive harm case coming up for the Supreme Court in this uh, FMI versus Argus, uh, Food Marketing Institute versus Argus Leader. So what we want to do here, uh, we, we started approaching this as a potential problem and saw um, it's happening in a lot of areas, government business, farmed out to private companies, um, it kind of goes through like a laundering thing there and all of a sudden they're private records. Um, and we saw a few main areas this was coming up, trade secrets, competitive harm, um, kind of weakening of the quasi-governmental doctrine, um, and then this, uh, uh, this kind of increasing ability of parties to come and intervene to try to close records. So we did this and a lot of research has been done in that area already um, on some of these things. And we thought, so it kind of took a holistic approach to it and looked at you know back to the roots and the philosophy of why FOIA exists, why open records laws exist, where this fits into that scheme, and then maybe what are some possible ways we can, um, we can deal with this uh, legislatively and in courts and other places. Um, the most pressing one right now is the Argus Leader case, so I want to turn it over to Amy to talk a little bit about that one before we get into some of the other stuff. So the, the Food Marketing Institute versus Argus Leader case comes out of South Dakota, uh, Argus Leader is a local newspaper in South Dakota that initially made a FOIA request for records related to the SNAP program, the, the food stamps program. Uh, the case goes back and forth, up and down through the federal courts, uh, through the Eighth Circuit. Uh, Argus Leader prevails, uh, and the US, uh, USDA basically says, fine, that's great, we're done. And all of a sudden, the Food Marketing Institute, which is a lobbying group for supermarkets uh, and convenience stores, intervenes as a third party. Um, and at issue here in the Argus Leader case are two really important uh, aspects uh, that we have seen in these public-private partnership kinds of cases that are really interfering with our ability to get access to what we fundamentally believe are government documents. Uh, and the first of those is essentially uh, how we're going to interpret the word confidential uh, in exemption for a FOIA. This is a word that appears in your state, many of your state open records laws as well, right? Whether or not um, governments can choose to withhold information that is confidential. So does confidential have its ordinary meaning that you and I think of? Or does confidential require, essentially, that there should be a showing of a likelihood of competitive harm? And that's the other aspect that the court's really considering uh, in the Argus Leader case, is what is the, is the threshold level of showing for competitive harm? Is it the Boeing versus Paxton wishy-washy standard that's come out of Texas that essentially says, oh, we think we might be hurt by this, so please, government, don't disclose it. Or is there some actual teeth to that that requires some kind of evidentiary proof um, of a substantial likelihood of actual competitive harm? 
Uh, so this case, uh, like we've said, is uh, scheduled for oral argument on April 22nd. Uh, you know, it'll be a really interesting case because this is our first test of the new court on an FOI issue, right? If you remember, the Roberts court has been fairly pro-FOI if you look at FCC versus AT&T. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see where the court comes down on this, and it could have a pretty serious ripple effect uh, across our states. So an important, an important case to watch. All right. Oh, back to me. Um, so uh, what we wanted to do uh, with this and the other cases around it is kind of go back to some FOIA basics and kind of the philosophy and uh, of why we have these laws. So I, I went to St. Harold. Um, from uh, the People's Right to Know, his study um, uh, commissioned uh, to study uh, state open records laws. And I always come back to, uh, this was the first line of my master's thesis from, oh my goodness, 15, no, 20 years ago at this point. Um, it shows up a lot, um, but it's, it's the, some of these foundational things about why these laws exist. And um, I, I even turn to um, a less popular case out of the Supreme Court. Um, I, I don't, um, you, know, you might shudder when I mention it, but Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press um, is not a popular case uh, among us because it did not help us at all and was overly restrictive. Um, but it did, it came up with the central purpose language. Central purpose has been used to deny access to records. It was invented out of whole cloth, of course, by the Supreme Court about why FOIA exists. It is not there in the legislative uh, uh, language or anywhere else. Um, it's always been used as a hammer against us. I do think it's something that we could potentially reclaim um, because if there's anything that the central purpose, and now again, this is federal law, not state law, but I think the federal law drives state law, it can be an example of it, when SCOTUS takes it up, it's kind of a big deal. Um, there is nothing more central um, to the purpose of uh, you know, a, an open records law than knowing what our government is up to when it comes to spending our tax dollars. Right? That, that is the core, that's why open records laws work. How are our tax dollars being spent? And Boeing versus Paxton and Greater Houston Partnership, another case out of Texas, um, some of these cases are, allowing, again, this kind of transparency laundering to go on. You're getting away from the central purpose and saying, hey, government, if you can pass that to a private agency, it's in the dark now, um, which uh, fundamentally undermines the purpose of these kinds of laws. And so we're, you know, we, we conflate a bit federal law and state law, but looking at the purpose and what is that going to mean for us and giving us some way, of kind of, again, for this holistic approach of records held by businesses which is happening more and more and more and more as government, governments privatize their duties and their responsibilities and then going behind closed doors where we can't find them. Um, so we looked at three particular areas. I've got to rush a little here to make sure everybody has time to talk. Um, that are related, we, and we looked at the case law on a lot of these. One of these is trade secrets. And these are, some, these are valid exemptions. They're just um, over-applied in a lot of cases. And so when we talk about exemption creep, how courts are approaching these more and more and more expansively in favor of businesses, of finding trade secrets that may not necessarily be there, of, um, again, the wishy-washy competitive harm standard, where it's not that it will cause competitive harm, but it might cause competitive harm in the uh, 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 attitude or the opinion of the company. Um, the big takeaway we had from this, um, Shall I skip ahead? yeah, let's go ahead and skip ahead, um, uh, going to um, uh, third party interventions. Uh, when, we, when we did all our research and we came to like, what are the conclusions, what are the ways to move forward? One was, uh, was focus on the Supreme Court, like really look at the language they used in Milner versus Department of the Navy, which was uh, Justice Kagan pulling back on expansion creep, saying we are gonna read these things very narrowly. Same in uh, F uh, uh, FCC versus AT&T, Justice Roberts saying, we're not going to say the personal privacy exemption covers businesses. If the legislature want, if the Congress wants to say that's a business privacy, then pass a business privacy exemption. Otherwise, it's narrow. We're really hoping that uh, in Argus Leader, they'll look at that same thing and say, we're going to construe exemption four narrowly, the same way the Eighth Circuit did. It's a little worrisome they took it up at all. This would have been a great one to leave alone. Um, so we're a little worried about what that might mean, particularly with a new court in place. Um, but when we came to the end, we said, well, what does this all mean? Like, what's really triggering a lot of this, particularly now? And it's this idea of third party intervention, uh, which is allowing parties who um, are not a party to the original request. So you have a requester and a government agency, or a requester and a business. They send it to the, the government agency, and somebody else comes in and says, wait a minute, my privacy rights are being implicated, I want to intervene. Um, that's what happened in FCC versus AT&T. Um, AT&T intervened and said, uh, it was a different request by somebody else, they said, no, that violates our business privacy. It took eight years to settle the fact that there is no business privacy um, in, in FOIA. Um, 
And the, basically, AT&T won by dragging it out for eight years and forcing somebody else to litigate it. Um, that's what's happening in Argus Leader, that the USDA gave up on this case. Um, a third party uh, jumped in and said, we want to continue to litigate this up. Boeing versus Paxton. Boeing intervened in a request from a citizen um, to the city of San Antonio that the attorney general denied. Um, or the attorney general said, no, you have to reveal that. The, all the appeals court said, no, you have to reveal that. Um, Boeing came in and intervened. It took, what, 10 years to go from trial to the end. Um, so what we're seeing here is more and more instances where this sort of thing can happen. And one of the concerns we have, I think is going to be next research project we do on this, is um, these third party intervention are, are, are largely built into statutes. They allow people to intervene if they believe their privacy rights may be implicated. That language may not be strong enough. And it's something I think we really ought to target um, as uh, advocates for FOIA because um, companies that don't want information being out there uh, in the public, like, um, like Boeing, um, like uh, some of these uh, chambers of commerce, like Greater Houston Partnership, which was trying to cover up um, information, like Amazon. Um, they can come in and intervene in a case with their lawyers and drag it out for years while people are trying to get information. And a lot of these are discretionary matters. And I think that's really what I want to focus on next is um, if it's within the government's discretion whether to give something out, it's not barred by privacy laws, but it's within their discretion, you shouldn't be able to intervene because you don't really have a right. There's no right there that exists. It's, you can come in and persuade, but anybody can come in and persuade. You shouldn't be able to go in and court and intervene. And by intervening, delay, 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 which is a classic, you know, we've seen this in any number of uh, areas on, on FOI law of delaying things as a, as a strategy and as a tactic. It is working right now. It's one of the places where businesses are eating our lunch when it comes to keeping their, their, them doing government work private. Um, so yeah, so we wrapped up with, uh, yes, Justice Louis Brandeis, going back to the classics. I mean, these are, we, we really went to, uh, to the, the fundamental purpose about why these laws exist. Glad to talk to you more about this later on. Thank you for your attention. So, okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Leah Wigren. I'm studying at the University of Nevada, Reno for a master's in journalism. And for about the past 19 years or so, I've been a federal criminal defense attorney in Reno. Um, the title of, and I'm working with Professor Patrick File, also UNR. Uh, the title of our paper is Slapping Back, Our Government Lawsuits, Lawsuits Against Record Requesters, Strategic Lawsuits Against Public Participation, or SLAP Suits. Um, and that, the title of that paper actually pretty well describes the, the, what this talk is about today. Um, experts in the public in information field have noticed a slight uptick, um, not, not a huge trend, but a slight trend upward in government lawsuits against public records requesters. And Professor and I, File and I are interested in this topic due to the potential chilling effect that such litigation might cause. So we wanted to explore further whether these types of cases were indeed slap suits, subject to dismissal um, under various anti-slap state statutes. So this talk will have two parts. Um, I will touch on some of the literature and discuss several uh, lawsuits involving government agencies against public records requesters. And then Patrick will present an overview of the various state anti-slap uh, statutes. And as many people in this, in this room might know, typically when the government sues a records requester, it's for a declaratory judgment, meaning that they're not seeking money or they're not trying to throw someone in jail, but they're trying to have a court declare, hence the term declaratory judgment, that records do not need to be released. Um, so, so even though this maybe isn't, people aren't worried about money or going to prison, it still can deter people from zealously fighting against such a lawsuit um, for fear that there might be attorney's fees at the end if they lose the suit because certain states will allow a, a losing party or force a losing party to pay attorney's fees. So that can be a big deterrent um, against, against people trying to fight off a, a government agency that might have endless resources. Um, as Penelope Kanan and George Pring found in their 1996 book, Slaps, Getting Sued for Speaking Out, a classic slap suit is meritless, and the, and the plaintiffs don't even intend or care to win it, but they rather bring it to deter or punish a party for exercising their right to, to access public um, information. Um, between 1976 and 2006, media law scholar Kathy Packer 
found that in 38 cases of the government suing people, only seven times did a court find that the government could not indeed sue people. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Packer opines that allowing the government to sue public records requesters turns access law on its head in that it provides a tool to punish and intimidate in contravention of government transparency laws. So Professor File and I studied eight cases that were filed between 2015 and 2018 where the government indeed sued records requesters. Three of those cases took place in states that had anti-SLAPP uh, statutes on the books. So we analyzed the facts of those three cases, and, and, and all eight, but we'll, we'll talk about three today, um, to see if those cases were subject to an anti-SLAPP motion to dismiss or motion to strike. The, the first case that I'll talk about involved the South Florida Water Management Agency versus Everglades Law Center. And the, the law center sought a transcript of a mediation between the, where the Water Authority and its attorneys discussed settlement of an ongoing, quite contentious it sounds like, environmental lawsuit. The Water Authority sued to pre, uh, prevent release of that transcript. And what, happened in, in, what happens in Florida is the government, the, the anti-SLAPP statute says, the government may not file a lawsuit without merit and primarily because a person or entity has exercised the constitutional right of free speech in connection with a public issue. So it allows a, a person or enti entity to file a motion for summary judgment, which as many know is a kind of a fancy <laughs> word for a motion to dismiss, basically. Um, and the, the, the person is allowed to have their claims decided expeditiously under the anti-SLAPP law. There is no time frame provided, however. Um, so in this case, the Environmental Law Center did indeed move to dismiss that case against it. Um, it's unclear, though, if they did use the state's anti-SLAPP statute to do that. And I, I called the, the uh, court clerk in the relevant Florida County about this. And much to her consternation, she couldn't find anything about the case, even though she was quite well aware of it. So she, you know, she was sort of searching her files and kind of somewhat frantic on the phone. I don't know if that meant something was under seal or what have you, but she was unable to tell me if um, the motion to dismiss was pursuant to one rule or one statute or another. Um, but it's logical to think that the ELC, being an a law center, would have used the, the anti-SLAPP uh, statute. Regardless, though, um, the judge found that the transcript was protected under the state's mediation laws, meaning that the mediation laws are pretty strong in most states, including Florida, in that participants are afforded confidentiality. But we also have kind of a double layer here in that there's an attorney-client privilege issue as well. So this is an example of where there's a, a good, you know, fairly strong anti-SLAPP um, law on the books, but it didn't help the law center in this case because of the mediation rules, and, and I, in my opinion, would also be attorney-client privilege. And again, I wasn't able to access any court documents on this, so this was me looking at newspaper reports about this case. The second case I'll talk about happened in Louisiana. Um, a former school district employee sought numbers about student en enrollment data, um, which impacted federal funding. So it, it appeared that some students had been, had dropped out or, or moved or just weren't in the school system anymore, but they were considered to be homeschooled. Um, that's what the Louisiana school district was saying. Um, so, so federal funding would not be reduced. And, and there were some people that were concerned about that. It seemed like it perhaps wasn't quite on the up and up. So the school district sued and sought a declaratory judgment. And it seems that the, the parties in this had had some, quite some interaction with the school district before with respect to with records requests and had done a lot of records requests. So there had been several times that the school district had lost against this certain person, but they just kept going after him every time he would make a request. But, but in fairness, it does sound like he also did. He was, he was kind of a thorn in their side. I think he made quite a few requests. Um, so the Louisiana anti-SLAPP law says that a cause of action against a person arising from any act in furtherance of the person's right of petition or free speech under the U.S. or Louisiana Constitution um, in connection with a public issue shall be subject to a special mo motion to strike unless the court determines that the plaintiff has established a probability of success on the claim. So this is a type of case that does appear pretty per perfectly postured, basically, for an anti-SLAPP motion to strike. But what it looks like happened in this case is fairly early on in the case, the, the court sort of spanked the school district and said, look, release the records and, and release them now. 
Um, so the defendants didn't have to do a motion to dismiss um, because the case was quickly, quickly resolved. So, but what was interesting in this case is that there was a stipulation that also said that the school district would not suppress student enrollment data. And when you hear the word suppress, it, you know, as an attorney especially, you sort of think that there was some, some stuff going on there that the school district, district was probably out of line. Um, the last case I'll discuss is in two, 2015 in Oregon, a reporter who was then with the Portland Tribune sought public records from the Portland Public Schools regarding teachers on leave. And some teachers had been on paid leave for years without their, their cases being disposed of or, or grievances worked out. Um, so the school sued um, to not have any of those records, records released. And the, the Portland anti-slap law allows a special motion, motion to strike when a claim is made against someone engaging in conduct in furtherance of the exercise of the constitutional right of, of petitioner free speech in connection with the public issue. So, I, but I, I actually spoke to the attorney um, in this case. He was quite generous with his time over email and phone talking to me about it. And they actually filed a motion for summary judgment in that case um, and won. Um, and I, I asked him, why wouldn't you use the anti-slap? And he just said, look, in Oregon, it's, it's a much more protracted process than a streamlined motion for summary judgment. Um, so we learn, I, we learn from this case that, that due to the very, various requirements of, of individual anti-state anti -state, um, anti-slap laws, um, an anti-slap motion to strike is not always the most expeditious route um, or economical option, time or money-wise. Um, however, in, in at least the second two cases I talked about, a motion to strike using the respective states' anti-slap laws would have been an appropriate option um, uh, show, and show, showing that this process might be a viable way for people who find themselves sued by the government um, to, to push back against such, such, such actions. Okay, so um, just in the interest of time, I know we want to kind of move things along here. Um, there, there, were the, there was a second track of this, uh, of the analysis that we took that I'm not going to really get into the weeds on, and I'd, I'd really encourage you to take a look at the paper uh, because uh, we were looking at 31 individual anti-slap laws across the country. Uh, essentially what we were able to do was categorize those into three categories. Uh, which were essentially sort of uh, uh, most likely to include public records requests, uh, somewhat likely and least likely. Um, and, you know, the language of some of those things and how it's sort of analyzed and how they fall into those categories is, is uh, there in the paper. Um, essentially, the, the key question that we were asking was the extent to which um, the, the law's definition of public participation, right, it's a, it's a uh, law against uh, strategic lawsuits against public participation, uh, does that definition of public participation encompass uh, records requests? So that was the question, and we answered it, as I say, with these three categories. Uh, the second uh, question that sort of came up and, and bubbled through that I thought was really interesting was whether the law exempts the government from an anti-slap motion. Um, and there are a number of states where that is the case. Usually the language that they use is they essentially uh, exempt a, an enforcement action brought by the government. So, it, you know, obviously this would apply to something where if someone's being prosecuted for shoplifting, then uh, you don't want them to be able to bring an anti-slap motion uh, to, to stop, you know, to, throw, to gum up the works in that case. Uh, whether or not that would apply to our circumstances, a public records request is, is sort of an open question. Uh, ultimately, sort of the big takeaway here is uh, th this was a pretty narrow overall scope uh, of what we did. Uh, focused on anti-slap laws as essentially one possible response to preemptive government lawsuits against public records requesters. For example, uh, we didn't look at how public records laws themselves might also short-circuit these suits. Um, ultimately, we argue that while a min minority, around 13 uh, anti-slap laws could be used to request, uh, use, uh, by requesters facing such suits, uh, it is clear that these laws are certainly not a panacea for records requesters who are sued by the government. <laughs> I have to be able to see the PowerPoint that's right. Oh, right. moving do you around. I see because it's even better. Let's do that. Yeah. Sure. Thank and you. Here's this. Because that angle's terrible from that scene. There you go. All right. My name is Ryan Mulvey. I'm an attorney at Cause of Action Institute in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'll try to be quick. Uh, just as, as a shameless self-promotion. For those of you who are interested in the B4 question, uh, my co-author and colleague James Valvo, who couldn't be here, he and I co-authored an amicus brief 
uh, on in support of the Argus leader. Yeah. Uh, check it out in the docket. We basically look into the history of the term confidential back to the English common law. So it's a good brief. Yeah. Oh, have you read it? Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's a good brief too. Good brief, yeah. So, <laughs> um, so the, our paper. Uh, and I'll try to be quick so we can get to some, some questions and discussion. Our paper basically did a comprehensive survey of how states are treating legislative records um, in the case law, in the statute, in advisory opinions. Um, uh, this, this work came out of, this research came out of an amicus brief that we filed in the state of Georgia for a case at IJ, the Institute for Justice, uh, is currently appealing, which sought records uh, of, of the legislature. Uh, so just an initial point, as you'll see on this map, um, our view is that the majority of states provide access to some sort of legislative material. Legislative records covers a lot of things. Um, in sort of categorizing states, we took a broad understanding of access. You know, there's a lot of granularity you can get into, not all states uh, for example, provide access to individual legislators, uh, constituent correspondence, for example. So the map could look different depending on what exactly you're looking at, but in a broad sense, most states are providing uh, access to legislative materials. Also, in the paper that you'll receive today, uh, there are some developments that aren't noted. Uh, in the case of Missouri, we, we missed it, uh, unfortunately. The, the Constitution has been amended, and there's now a provision that broadened the scope of legislative records that are subject to public disclosure. Uh, also, last month, Michigan uh, passed most of the pending Legislative Open Records Act in the House. It's before the Senate. That would basically create a new statute mirroring the FOIA that would only be subject to the legislature. And then in South Carolina, there's a pending case that some newspapers have brought. Uh, they received, the trial court ruled against them in whether the House Republican Caucus and legislative caucuses in general were subject uh, to the state FOIA, and I understand that's likely to be appealed. So that's a case to look for. And there's a pending case in Washington, too, that the AP brought that I think is scheduled for argument later this summer before the Supreme Court. So keep, keep an eye out for that. Um, all right, so uh, our, our finding was most states are providing access, and of the states that provide access to legis legislative materials, most of them are doing it expressly. So the FOIA statute mentions the legislature or some part of the legislature. But let's dig a little deeper. Uh, of those states with express access to legislative records, um, as you'll see, two of them are doing it with a constitutional provision. Two of them do it in how they define the sorts of records that are subject to disclosure, but the majority of them are doing it based on how they define the entities that are subject to the open records law. And in nine cases, that's, that's based uh, on the definition of an agency. It's broad enough to include the legislature or some part of it. Uh, and then in ele another 11 states, there are other terms, public body, authority, government entity. Um, but you can kind of see that, generally speaking, uh, FOIAs, uh, FOILs address the legislature with express language. I think this is the most interesting chart. When the FOIL is silent, where there's statutory silence or statutory ambiguity, uh, yet there has been determined to be access to some sort of legislative materials, in 10 cases, that's based on, on the definition of a governmental entity subject to the FOIA. Um, and the best example, six of those 10, it's because the FOIL uses the term branch. And in the American system, there are three coordinate branches of government. The legislature is one of them. When the statute doesn't say anything else, branch um, and courts and state attorneys general have, have ratified this uh, interpretation. They've been understood to uh, include legislative records. And then in the remaining states, it's based on, on the definition of, uh, of what a, a record is or a public record. Um, now, the shaded six um, that are on there, three from the one category and three from the other, are states where there are statutory exemptions in the FOIL that are particular to a subset or a particular set of legislative records. And our view of, of the trend is that the presence of these statutory exemptions implies that a, a broader set or universe of legislative materials has to be subject. Otherwise, the exemption doesn't make much sense. And 
uh, our conclusion, I think, is supported by the evidence. Uh, there's only one state that bucks the trend here, and we'll get to that in a second. It, all six of these, uh, where there are statutory exemptions, uh, the courts and the executive branch have all agreed that the presence of the exemption suggests legislative materials generally, legislative records, are subject to disclosure. So in states that exclude the legislature, it's Eight, uh, in eight of the 12 cases, uh, it's done explicitly. The statute will say the legislature is excluded. The legislative branch is excluded. In two cases, it's by implication. Uh, so Alaska is a good example. They define agency as any government entity under the executive branch. Well, the legislature is not part of the executive branch. So therefore, uh, even though the statute isn't explicit about it, uh, the legislature is excluded. Uh, and then we have two cases where the states um, have excluded the legislature based on, on solely on judicial interpretation. That the statute is, is rather broad and could be read to include the legislature, but in these two cases, uh, we've come out the other way. So Massachusetts, I think it's 1976, it's been a while, they determined that the general court, which is the state legislature, is excluded. Georgia, uh, I mentioned the IJ case earlier, that's currently before the Court of Appeals, so it's still pending. Uh, the, the court there looked to the open meetings uh, act of the statute of the state and read the Open Records Act in a similar way. Uh, and they, in a, you'll read in the paper, they, they didn't even address the statutory exemption, the presence of the exemption in any meaningful way. Um, and then this is a, the second part of the paper. I, I don't have time to get into it. But basically, it's pretty clear that Congress and individual members of Congress and committees are not subject to the federal FOIA. But there are two areas that I don't think people think about very often where there might be room to push for greater uh, access uh, to congressional type records. And the first is with legislative branch agencies, Architect of the Capitol, Library of Congress. Um, the, some components of these agencies are subject to the FOIA, so the Copyright Office is a good example. And there is some case law that I think the requester community could latch on to that suggests courts might be willing to take the sort of functional, functional approach that they do with, um, in cases where requesters are trying to get records of EOP components. Um, where they look to what is the legislative branch agency really doing? Do they have statutory authority? Are they administering law in some way? Um, and there might be room to, to make some progress there. Uh, the functional approach was adopted in a, in a case, uh, I think 20 years ago, about the GPO, which deals with the Federal Register, which in my mind, records about the administration of the Federal Register should be subject to FOIA. But, uh, and then finally, there's uh, the modified control test. So when Congress passes or members pass records onto an agency, or when an agency responds to a congressional oversight request by creating records or compiling what would otherwise be agency records and sending them over, some agencies have argued that these now become magically congressional records and you can't get them. So this is kind of a hot topic. ACLU had a case that they tried to get cert at the Supreme Court. I'm litigating this against the IRS. There's a lot of novel applications of the modified control test. And I think courts, there's been a developing awareness that we have to be careful that Congress and agencies don't over apply the test and sweep materials um, that ought to be disclosable under FOIA out of reach as congressional records. Thank you. Operator Q and A leader, because um, it ought to be noted uh, as director of the Breckner Center at the University of Florida. Now that uh, NFYC is uh, basically partnered there. They, they provide NFYC, what, is it fifty or $60,000 worth of in-kind um, space? It's higher. Uh, uh, staffing, we share staff. It's an incredible, incredible help to, to, the, to the whole cause. So Frank, thank you for everything you do. Thanks. Thank you. And as an, extension, as an extension of that partnership, is this not working? As an extension of that partnership, Dave didn't brag on himself, but I will. Uh, the uh, Breckner Center is launching this year, and you'll see some of these articles, and I hope some of the articles that are
presented at the poster session this afternoon. And new online peer review journal that is going to debut under Dave's editorship called the Journal of Civic Information. This is going to be a quarterly peer review online journal to fill what we identified as a need in the field. No offense to my PhD friends, some of my best friends are PhDs, but uh, <laughs> the, the reality is that there's a lot of need for what I call actionable research, research that actually puts practical, useful tools sure. in the hands of people, the the people the the litigators, the journalists, and the FOI lobbyists and advocates. And so that's what the Journal of Civic Information is going to devote itself to. And this is exactly the kind of research that we're hoping to incentivize and to, to draw out from people in the field. So kudos to everybody here, all of the presenters, including the ones you'll see the student name, for meeting that challenge to come up with research that will not sit on a shelf and gather just a research that will actually help people make real change. Um, I'm going to be really quick because I, I do want to leave time if anybody here wants to jump in with one. My goal was, first of all, I think these papers were all both wonderfully done and also really of great practical value answering pressing questions that people like me get asked all the time. How many legislatures are, 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 are amenable to FOIA? That's the kind of question that comes to our door all the time. Thank goodness somebody sat down and actually took the time to do that work for us. And, and this gives us a foundation to, to build on for the future. Um, I thought I would just throw out a couple of uh, discussion questions and then invite the, the, the group to chime in. On the Patrick and Leah's wonderful presentation about SLAB, um, I had a thought on that, and I'm wondering if this thought emerged in your research or if you have a reaction to it. You heard them talk about this idea of declaratory judgment action, right? And normally, the person bringing the declaratory judgment action, the plaintiff, is claiming that somehow they are whipsawed between two conflicting legal obligations. That's normally what that is meant for, right? I am damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. I'm going to expose myself to liability to someone, and that is why I need you, judge, to sort out these conflicting claims. That makes some sense to me, I don't agree with it, but it makes some sense to me when there is a mandatory privacy-based withhold, a must withhold. Right? Yeah. It makes no sense at all to me when there is a discretionary may withhold. You do not have two conflicting obligations anymore. You have the government's interest in secrecy against the requester's interest in having the request fulfilled. Did you observe that there was any distinction like that being made either in the case on the statutes or should there be? Or no. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess um, I don't have a really good answer to that, partly because, again, sort of what we're looking at were, you know, uh, uh, I mean, my, my big part of the paper had to deal with the anti-slap laws rather than kind of looking at uh, much of the litigation and where I was in litigation. It had to do with uh, the sort of the way that the courts were defining public participation. What I will say, though, um, is that uh, that, and, and you can find the citation in our paper, uh, to, to uh, uh, Kathy Packer's work, which I think was published in 20, 2006 or 2007, um, that was looking at that question of how courts have sort of determined, you know, when you can and can't, uh, uh, you know, essentially get that declaratory judgment out of a court. Typically what they've looked at is, you know, these sort of circumstances the courts have said, uh, you know, this, you're, you're, you're jumping out, you're out of line of the procedure here. Right, which is to say, you know, where where um, uh, the government doesn't win these cases, the courts say, you know, the way that this works is, someone requests a record, you deny it, and then they sue you. That's you don't get to sue them. Um, and so, I mean, it, it's kind of a, a oblique answer to your question, but where the courts have, have kind of tried to answer that question, it's it's been a, just sort of along those lines. It's sort of procedurally, this isn't how it works. I think where an FOI law is more clear about what the procedure is, the less likely that the government is going to be able to sort of successfully get those lawsuits because uh, uh, and, and and get a judgment um, be, because of that clarity in the law. I think. Parenthetically, I hope we can talk more about this declaratory judgment yeah. issue. We've got a bill percolating in my state in Florida. I wish Mark Peterson was here to brief you on it, but we've got a bill percolating in my state to try to either outlaw or at least limit the use of that device. And it's right. very hopeful to see other states follow, follow suit. Uh, for Amy and Chef, I'm wondering about you mentioned the mechanism by which a third party, normally a business, that feels like they have some sort of privacy interest at stake in this FOIA, right, that litigation will always start requester the government agency, but then business intervener may in fact take up the ball and run with it, right, and they say, no, 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 
I believe I have a privacy interest here. I am now intervening. I've become a party to the lawsuit, and now I am running with the lawsuit. And now it really becomes business view requester. I'm wondering, what does that do to attorney's fees? The person like Boeing who prolongs that case for nine years, that person is really the person that has now caused me as the requester to inflict upon myself nine years worth of attorney's fees. What provision, if any, is there for the intervener who really is driving the litigation to be liable for fees? <laughs> You're going to hand that one to me. Uh, that was a wonderful question for me. Um, so I mentioned there's more research we're going to be working on in this area, and I think you just uh, put your finger on the sort of thing we should be looking at on it. Because um, it's not something we've thought about, but it's an absolutely valid question. Um, the issue here is procedural, that we're, we start getting outside the law of you know, whether a record's open or not. That's not really in play anymore. The re I think that a lot of places have realized that's not one we win whether that's open or not. It's how long can we drag things out and keep some things closed and, mix, and make people just want to give up. Yeah. Um, and that's a, uh, it can, almost like slap, it, you know, it's a kind of deterrent. It, it, was, it was interesting hearing that paper and seeing how much overlap, like theoretically, conceptually they have. Yeah. You know, it's procedural remedies that exist to deter requesters, yeah. to make their lives miserable for trying to find out what their government is doing. Um, so I can see, for example, um, if we were to go and tackle third-party intervention uh, statutorily, you know, go and say, we need to fix this for the discretionary part. Um, also, you know, fee shifting, if there's already a fee shifting thing saying, yeah, get that away from the city and push it to the intervener if they're going to lose these suits. Yeah. I have not seen that, but I also didn't look for it, and now I will. <laughs> Real quick to, to, to Ryan, uh, on, on yours, and this may be down the scope of your research, this may be just that gut reaction I'm asking for. Do you have any sense or impression whether in the states where the legislature is amenable to a public records request. Would that in any way have the deleterious, the, the unintended consequence of making the legislators less supportive of a broad concept of FOIA, right? With a legislator who knows that they themselves must live under something like an attorney fee provision or something like a provision that gets at electronic text messages on a personal device, would they be less likely to, to take a broad view of the scope and, the, and the, the penalty provisions of FOIA when they themselves have to live under? Well, I, I haven't looked at, at the penalty, the, the fee penalty uh, t aspect, but I, I have gotten the impression that be, because my research seems to suggest that in most cases the legislators are the ones subjecting at least some part of the legislative branch to the FOIA, nevertheless, they're usually pretty good in making sure that there are adequate exemptions available to protect uh, the sorts of records which they would least like to get out into the public. So, I, I mean, just to use an example, I mentioned that Missouri now has amended its constitution to broaden the scope of legislative records that are subject to disclosure as public records. Um, well, the legislature is now attempting to pass a bill, um, and I think it's written into a, a, like a reform of the Lobbying Act, so um, Nate kind of mentioned how sometimes exemptions get, you know, they get sneaked in through other forms of, um, of legislation. They're trying to exempt constituent correspondence and certain forms of deliberative materials. So even in states where you have uh, the legislature as a whole is amenable, nevertheless, the elected officials are concerned about not going too far and making sure the things that might be most uh, embarrassing, um, yet also probably most private and therefore should be exempt, um, that they're taking those out of, of the statute. Maybe over time, right? I don't know if we have any time for audience questions. Here, I'll show you. Okay. Good order. And suddenly it's the price of pay. I wonder if there are any cases where um, corporations have intervened in that arena. <coughs> 
because that's been going on for years. And so I feel like that is kind of a, something to look to as a producer. Um, the short answer to that is not only are there cases out there on that, um, but I was alarmed to see that in several of the state FOI laws that I looked at, there are actually specific exemptions that cover university research contracts with private companies and that kind of information. Um, and that's just, that's just another classic example of what we're talking about, right, with these sort of public-private partnerships and all of that information coming out of, out of the light. Um, offhand, I'm going to tell you, I think maybe six, seven state laws um, that had provisions related to that, um, and a handful of cases, probably less than a dozen. Um, but that's certainly an area that I think we need to be concerned about, too, when you look at how much money and resources, particularly at state universities, are being funded into that kind of work. Frank's getting his steps in today. Yeah, right. I mean, right. It's really all about Frank. <laughs> I thought I heard that there were legislative efforts underway to, um, to undo or at least mitigate the outcome of the Boeing case. There are. Uh, It's funny, uh, Kelly Shannon and I were just talking about that, about that beforehand. Uh, a couple, we also had a really disastrous Open Meetings Law, uh, Open Meetings Act decision earlier this year that basically reauthorized walking quorums. <laughs> it's stunning that it would come out that way, but uh, there are three bills, I think, that have moved forward, uh, that, well, at least two, one on open records, one on open meetings, that have uh, both passed the Senate and are before the House. Yeah, so these are, all, as we were talking about how to get this article published, we realized that after Argus Leader is decided and after the Texas legislative session, those may all have shifted by then. Ideally for the better, but we're bracing ourselves for the worst. We were a little more confident, or we were, I would say we were more confident. We were pretty confident in 2017 legislative session that those fixes were going to pass and they didn't get a vote. So we're a lot, I'd say more confident this time, but we're certainly hopeful. Well, good. Well, um, let's uh, wrap this up so we can uh, get on uh, to the next session. But first, uh, time to give them their goodies. So um, for uh, third place, uh, which is astounding, Patrick uh, File and Leah Weigren. Uh, here you go. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, um, uh, second place is actually Alexa, and I'm going to butcher this, uh, Ca Capilato? Yes. Yeah, all right. This is $300. $300, good job. And um, I feel like Trump. And um, <laughs> for first place, that's my third Trump reference today. Um, yeah. <laughs> and first place, uh, Amy Kristen Sanders from UT Austin and Daxton Chip Stewart from Texas Christian uh, University. Five hundred dollars. Good job. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and uh, they insisted that their five hundred dollars goes instead to the Texas Freedom of Information Foundation. So. They're, they make the rest of us look bad. So um, thank you all. Good job. And